Uh, I'll just take a brief moment to introduce our speaker because I know he has a, an action-packed uh, lecture for you. Uh, but just as uh, uh, by way of background, uh, Dr. Roman Sukach comes to us from the Silesian University in Opava, which is in the northern part of the Czech Republic. He got his PhD from Bern, the, the Brno Masaryk University in Brno um, in Indo-European linguistics. Uh, we are working this month on a, a multi-year project on the historical phonology of Czech, which is why he's in the U.S. at the moment. And uh, we spend about a month uh, in each other's country working together intensively, or as intensively as our schedules allow. Um, I figured that for a public talk, however, uh, talking about European linguistics or historical phonology wouldn't be quite as interesting as talking about where he's from. Uh, Roman is uh, interested in a number of different fields and he has a very strong interest in history both as a reader and uh, receiver of history but also somebody who's done some original research and kind of lives in an area that's steeped in, in history that's waiting to be done. He lives in uh, rural Silesia, uh, not far from Opava, and uh, this is an area that is a kind of palimpsest which he'll talk to you about next week in his talk on the 19th at 4 in Aldrichstein Auditorium, the palimpsest or the layering of different ethnic groups and historical themes in Silesia. He's also been a, a co-author of a book which I'll tell you about uh, that's rediscovering uh, or coming to terms with the life of the socialist uh, regime. So after the, the Velvet Revolution, uh, there's been a, a, a renewed interest in what, uh, what was suppressed or what wasn't studied during that period. The things of taboo are now being uh, discussed more openly. Uh, so he's prepared two lectures, one of them uh, on everyday life in Czechoslovakia, which is today, and the 19th on Silesia. And I think I'll just let uh, Roman talk uh, about his topic rather than taking up all the airtime. So in my lecture, I would like to talk about um, everyday life in Czechoslovakia in the period from 1948 uh, to 1967. Uh, why? Several years ago, I was a member of a team which worked uh, on such a project, and the members uh, of the team were historians, culturologists, politologists, literary and film historians, and me as a linguist. The goal of the project was to map uh, everyday life and uh, culture policy within ideological and propaganda frame. The period was limited by 1948 when communists took power and 1967, a year before the political changes uh, of Prague Spring. The two-volume book, which was published uh, this year, contains about 200 and, uh, two, sorry, 2,500 articles. Those articles uh, try to describe everything which an average Czech could have been surrounded by popular radio, TV programs, uh, new architecture, various kinds of propaganda, popular products uh, which were sold, collective cultural and working actions, in fashion, music trends. I can uh, have those books circulated. Okay, I think it might be uh, uh, great to say something very briefly about the history of this, this period. In February 1948, communists took power. The ideological principles of Marxism and Leninism and socialistic realism pervaded cultural and intellectual life. The economy was committed to comprehensive central planning and abolition of private ownership of capital, uh, uh, collectivization and heavy industrialization. And Czechoslovakia became a satellite state of the Soviet Union and adopted a Stalinist pattern of government and policy to its opponents, which were systematically eliminated. Show trials um, are typical, uh, is a typical feature of this period. 1960s, however, are called the period of talk, which means de-Stalinization, uh, democratic centralism, and a very slow way to reform, reformation of socialism from above, which culminated in Prague Spring 1968. And the end of this uh, reformation process was abruptly ended by the occupation of Czechoslovakia by troops of Warsaw Pact. On this picture, you can see uh, Generalissimus Stalin, of course, and this is our first president, Clement Gottwald, who was also uh, a Stalinist. Happy, smiling, and 
comes out in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> After 1948, the Czechoslovak government started immediately to influence privacy of its citizens. Both private as well as working life should be performed collectively. As an illustration, the phenomenon, the phenomenon of brigades can be illustrated, brigada in Czech. Brigades uh, meant working activities in free time of citizens. Officially, they were voluntary, but practically compulsory. People could be called upon to participate in a brigade which, uh, uh, to help with harvest, cleaning, building, things like that. Of course, that members of the brigade did not obtain any money, because they were working happily for the rest of the population. As those women <clears throat> uh, on the potato brigade under the supervision of an experienced member of the cooperative farm. A lot of brigade activities were done at schools and of course using voluntary help of children was a significant help to national economy, especially when such a cheap labor force was misused. <clears throat> the higher level of brigade organization was Brigada Socialistické práce, or in English, Socialist Work Brigade. Those brigades were organized in factories and the aim was to promote both collective work as well as higher working achievements. The first brigade was organized in 1958 in a Czech coal mine and in two years later already <clears throat> 140,000 brigades existed. It means more than 160,000 workers. All brigades gave an undertaking to fulfill a plan and redo their members within the meaning work and live in a socialistic way. Members of the brigades compete to get a badge bronze, silver and gold, gold and as a reward they could use special vacation resorts with other brigade members. It was also expected that brigades would participate in the education of school children in the form of discussions, sport activities and so on. <clears throat> Soviet culture started to be experienced as a model of art and propaganda. Here we can see um, a typical example of socialistic realism according to doctrine by Zhdanov. This is a propaganda poster uh, where all the required conditions are fulfilled. The typification of character, so this is, this is the doctor with, uh, uh, wearing a Soviet, Soviet uh, costume. Um, so a membership of a certain certain social class, uh, party's aim in the socialistic future, here we can see the happy, happy people. Popularity, so work, uh, work must be maximally illustrative and intelligible. Yes. And Soviet model is represented by the photography of uh, Pavlov, this is not Darwin, but Pavlov. <laughs> Uh, Bolshaya Savitskaya Encyclopedia <laughs> <laughs> and painting uh, showing probably a spa on the coast of Black Sea, cream or something like this. Uh, the, this is probably Tatry because uh, the, uh, the sentence is Slovak. Podla sovietskeho obzoru budujeme socialistické zdravotnictvo. So according to Soviet model we built a uh, socialistic uh, medicine. Yeah. On the picture here, you can see the town Havirov, um, a city in the eastern part of Czech Silesia, so in, in the area where I live. Havirov was founded after World War II, uh, thus being the youngest city in today's Czech Republic, as a coal mining town. Officially, it became a town in 1955. It was built on top of several villages with significant Polish population. The local people were given apartments in the new, newly built city and most of their old houses were demolished to make room for new urban buildings. But the majority of population of Havijov immigrated from uh, other parts of Czechoslovakia and uh, many of them from Slovakia as migrant workers, thus substantially altering the ethnic structure of the area. The whole town is a classic example of socialistic realism in architecture of 1950s and 1960s. So flat, grey, 
uh, unimaginative buildings uh, without any decorations. We can see a big warehouse or obchodní dům in Czech and a cluster of flat apartment houses made of concrete panels. Also here. <clears throat> Those houses are therefore called panelaki, which was uh, because they were they were made from uh, concrete panels, and the whole complex is called sídliště. The building of sídliště was a typical product of housing policy socialistic era. So houses were cheap, built quickly, and could accommodate a lot of people. However, sídliště had many disadvantages: bad roads, which looked new, but they were very bad. <laughs> uh, problems with infrastructure and with isolation, with warm isolation. Uh, but Havijov is an example of uh, the so-called classical or classic socialistic realism of 1950s and even recently became an urban reserve. The further development of Sidlishtia policy led to uh, gigantic areas like in Prague. So if you go to Prague, you can see Yizhny Miesto, this south town. But this is from 1917s, 19. Uh, 80s, where big complexes of Sidlishtia were built. This is a classical example of 1950s. Okay. Um, 1950s are also connected with the cult of manual labor. The main topic of newsreels uh, was uh, very often the description of various forms of manual work. The regime wanted to make a new uh, nobility from people who made enormous performances in their manual work. According to Soviet model of Stakhanov, a Czech variant called Urernik was created. I'm not sure about the, uh, the English translation, but Urer means, uh, Uderzik means to hit, so it's a sort of hitman or something like that. Shock worker. Shock worker. Shock worker. Okay. Uderniks, I use the Czech term, were financially motivated and the regime made them very prominent people in the society. For example, they could have uh, been given a post of general manager in the factory. Although the official propaganda presented them as modest people working only for the welfare of the society. One of the problems of Urenik uh, movement was that there were so many of them. <laughs> Apart from extra, ma extra money, they were also eligible for extra food products, sometimes very special ones. So after the massive promotion of Urerni movements in books, posters, films, and discussions, very soon the problems of food supply appeared. So after 1953, the movement slowly weakens. The dark side of Urerni uh, movement was the fact that a lot of cases of outstanding achievement, achievements were virtual, and uh, some special conditions had to be prepared for those, those people. Average workers also hated Urerniks because their achievements led to bigger requirements, so a higher plan had to be fulfilled. <laughs> Urernik movement had sometimes uh, very uh, absurd situations, and uh, as you will see uh, in the film, um, short film, which I will show you, please try to observe the very uh, innovative technological process. Závazek k druhému všeobodnému sjezdu, to znamená práci za první rok pětiletky, 
už 12. července tohoto roku. I don't know what he did to uh, the, last, uh, the rest of the year. <laughs> it was the challenge for the United States. <laughs> One of the typical features of everyday life in the uh, 1950s was the persuasion uh, of seeing the black and white frame of the world. Everything which was Soviet was great, good, successful, peaceful, and welfare oriented. Everything which was Western and American was bad, mean, war, exploitation oriented. Our Western neighbors were not just neighbors, but were American barbarians, Wall Street murderers, perfidious warmongers, and so on. The political opposition was often labeled as spies of the Vatican or flunkies of the West. On those posters, you can see uh, an example of black and white polarization of a word. Um, a wicked, wicked American barbarian killing children in Korea. This is obviously a Korean. Uh, <coughs> by German bombs. Uh, other children from Africa and Asia <clears throat> still do not feel any danger from this aggressor. But a muscular, clean-shaved socialist worker holds the aggressor's hand back, uh, hand, hand back peacefully but firmly. On the second poster, uh, the steel workers uh, work hard so that the national economy could be built quickly, uh, and also army, of course. Uh, the flowing hot steel Fats warmongers, which are also uh, uh, typified. So there's an American barbarian. Where is he? Um, maybe this one. Uh, a Pope. Churchill. And this is probably I don't know which one is this, but um, one of one of these three is Adenauer. Adenauer. <clears throat> uh, so people should work and work so uh, that the country became economically and militarily powerful, which will last for some An average citizen in 1950s was constantly bombarded by information about uh, various spies, enemies, traitors, things like that. Show trials were the top one form of the political persecution. From 1948 to 1960, about 1,000 and 60, uh, 1060, uh, sorry, 160,000 people were sentenced, uh, 250 people were executed. The big trials were usually heavy, heavily medialized by broadcasting and even detailed reports in newspapers. On the picture, on, on those pictures here, we can see the most infamous ones, a trial with Milara Horakova and um, she, uh, she was a political opponent of communists and a trial with Rudolf Slansky. The trial with Horakova was exceptional with uh, the public response. Almost uh, 6,300 letters of factory collectives and individuals came to the court asking for the death penalty. Also with very negative rhetorics. So Horakova was uh, very often called a doubted criminal. <clears throat> the court was therefore influenced by a new phenomenon, the organized anger of the people. In the main process with Horakova, four people were exe uh, executed, including Horakova uh, herself, and President Gottwald refused to grant a pardon. Rudolf Slansky uh, was a victim of party purge accompanied, uh, accompanied with anti-Semitism. The trial was more monstrous than uh, the one with Horakova. On the picture, uh, we can see Horakova proudly standing in the courtyard because she refused uh, to repeat those memorized testimonies which caused, which caused problems with, for judges and investigators. But on another picture, uh, Rudolf Slansky, <coughs> who uh, himself uh, uh, used to give orders to mental and physical tortures of the political prisoners, now himself uh, uh, is being broken down by the same methods of 
and, re and we uh, uh, repeat it constantly memorized accusations like a robot. Recordings uh, of both trials were uh, published as uh, books. Try to guess the press run. 80,000 uh, copies translated in four languages. German, English, French, and Russian. Okay. Well, Marxism is a crypto-religious movement, and uh, together with other main religions, it has its own idea of rightful and happy society. I will show you a short film. seen the socialistic paradise, the happy people harvesting various <laughs> kinds of fruits and the chair of the cooperative farm as a socialistic god. Well, uh, a nice lifestyle promoted by the regime in 1950s, but something was uh, defective in this, paradigm, uh, in this paradise. Alcoholism, of course. Um, let me see. A little bit. Okay. Oh, some <clears throat> Uh, alcoholism started to be a great problem in 1950s. At the beginning of uh, 1960s, there were about 200,000 registered alcoholics. But the amount of unregistered uh, ones was, of course, much more bigger. <clears throat> we were on the sixth um, world power uh, um, rank in the con consumption of pure alcohol. The problem started to be uh, very acute because more and more teenagers got drunk. Um, although here are some common alcoholic products like borovichka and vodka, <clears throat> the most widespread beverage was beer. Czechoslovakia occupied the first position in beer consumption in that, that period. But alcoholism was not a problem of teenagers. For example, steel workers <coughs> consumed beer in work uh, because of uh, the higher temp temperatures. And when the authorities tried to replace uh, beer with syrup and soda, steel workers refused to go to work. So the attempt was unsuccessful. <laughs> so the regime had to cope with alcoholics in another way. In 1951, the first sobering upsell, maybe I translated it right, in Czech Zachytna Stanice was established, means to uh, for the, the, the drunkers to, to get sober. 
And up to 1967, so to the end of our period, which, which we examined, there were already 200 of such cells and the many advisory centers. Brigade activities, which I mentioned before, were often connected with massive propaganda campaigns in the media. One of the famous campaigns in 1950s, which mobilized the whole nation, was the campaign against American bargain. Okay, I will show you a short film. This fact was uh, immediately used for propaganda. The government officially declared that the bug was imported to Czechoslovakia by Western and American imperialists by means of clothes, wind, and secret agents. With the black and white rhetoric, it was proclaimed that our nation will respond to this willful act by <clears throat> annihilating all the bugs and all the enemies, of course. So, potato bug was called an American bug, a Wall Street ambassador. <laughs> on the children's book, yeah. uh, you can see the picture of Fat Bug, or Fat Imperialist, uh, with decorations on wing cases, uh, which are similar to uh, stars and stripes. <clears throat> Some bugs uh, had, oh, had uh, also an Uncle Sam's hat or U.S. soldiers' helmet. A massive campaign against the bug started and all media mobilized uh, people to kill bugs. Such an act was considered a patriotic need. Also, school children were instructed, like in this book, it's actually the comics, and called to the fields and massively collect and kill the bugs. Uh, already in 1950s, the Soviet uh, consultants uh, started just uh, potato fields. Uh, anyway, the campaign continued up uh, to the end of 1950s. Then the bug was demystified and became again a normal pest. Uh, uh, this is also a very interesting uh, uh, kind of propaganda because um, uh, 
regime used uh, safety matches uh, for propaganda. So this is uh, a painting from Safety Matches Cobra, uh, which uh, mobilize, uh, mobilizes uh, people um, to uh, protect fields from, from this bug. So save crops, potato crops before the American bug. And if you find the bug, call it immediately to this uh, village or town council so that it will be destroyed. Despite economic problems, the situation in late 1950s and early 1960s was, was uh, relatively uh, stable and the regime allowed its citizens to live in a moderate luxury. Two typical examples uh, can be shown. The magazine Jena Amoda, Woman and Fashion, uh, started in late 1950s, claimed the return to the world fashion, published clothes, uh, patterns uh, reprinted from Western fashion magazines, so that women could either buy such a model or even make uh, it themselves. Fashion from abroad started to be popular in Czechoslovakia and some models were even made in home factories. The second picture uh, shows a coupon from the Tuzex shop. The first Tuzex um, uh, was opened in 1957 and the change, uh, chain of those shops uh, offered uh, high-class uh, products and products imported from Western countries. So Czech citizens would even buy American jeans. However, there was a big hypocrisy behind it, of course. The state wanted foreign currency and the aim of Tuzex uh, chain stores was to collect uh, the foreign currency diplomats, workers coming back from Asia or Africa, or people who legally obtained money from the West. In Tuzex, they could exchange this foreign currency for such coupons, um, and with those coupons to buy products. The exchange rate uh, between coupons and check crowns immediately began um, uh, a means of uh, speculations. So at the black market, those coupons, or in Czech slang, boni, were sold for a better price. The dealers changed uh, the money for coupons, or in German, the Wechseln. So they were soon labeled Wechslatzi. And many important people in our government uh, began, our current government began their career with them Wechseln. <coughs> okay. From the period of thought, this 1960s and relative uh, political release, uh, I uh, I've chosen two moments which can be used as an example of a uh, different everyday life of uh, Czechoslovak uh, people. Uh, the first one is Big Beat. Big Beat is a Czechoslovak term for rock music. Originally it was a term for rock and roll, which, but the term was a taboo. The origin of the term is unclear. Uh, for the first time, it appeared uh, at the poster of uh, 1960 uh, band uh, Sputnitsy. It was about 1962 or something. Big Beat was very popular among uh, young generation and was connected with the massive listening of uh, Radio Luxembourg. And uh, also it was a means of emphasizing the new generation gap, so 1950s and 1960s. One of the main uh, protagonists of Big Beat was Mickey Wolek, who is here. I will show you a um, clip with uh, Mickey Wolek. Well, the situation you will see is not different from other rock and roll concerts in the West, but I wonder if you notice something different.
<clears throat> so, did you notice any, any difference? First, most people in the hall, uh, in the music hall, uh, sat. Like in the concert of classical music, uh, only the hooligans in the first row are jumping. Uh, so people had to had to sit uh, in those um, in those music halls. And second, you may have noticed a policeman in the front of concert hall inspects the people standing outside. If they are unemployed or social parasites in the previous discourse, or maybe if their haircut is correct. Uh, this is uh, this last sentence is connected with this, this picture <clears throat> because long-haired people were called manichki. I don't know the origin uh, of uh, of this term. We even didn't didn't find the origin. Manichka is a Czech term used for young people with long hair, usually males, in Czechoslovakia through 1960s and 1970s. It is also associated with uh, a generation gap like Big B. So it was a matter of image and style, not only a political proposition. <coughs> However, such ex extravagant appearance was not tolerated by a regime, and those young rebels were often forced to cut their hair in public. From the mid-1960s, uh, the long-haired and untidy persons, uh, called Manichki or Vlasatsi, were banned from entering pubs, cinema halls, theaters, using public transportation in several cities and towns. For example, in 1964, the public transportation regulations in Most and Litvinov, so towns in northern Bohemia, excluded long-haired Manichki as displeasure poking persons. Two years later, the municipal council in Podjebrady, in uh, central Bohemia, banned Manichki from entering cultural institutions in the town. And in August 1966, Rude Pravo, uh, party uh, daily, informed that Manichki in Prague were banned from visiting restaurants of the first and the second price category. In 1966, during a big campaign coordinated by Communist uh, Party of Czechoslovakia, around 4,000 young males were forced to cut their hair publicly. <coughs> Uh, or in the cells with the assistance of the state police. And on the 19th August 1966, during a safety intervention organized by state police, 140 long haired people were arrested just because they had long hair. <clears throat> As a response, the community of those long haired people organized a protest in Prague. Uh, more than 100 people shared slogans like, give us our hair, give us, give us back our hair, away with the hairdressers. <laughs> and state police arrested the organizer and several participants uh, of the meeting, and some of them were given prison sentences. The official propaganda showed uh, Manichki as um, harmful criminal drug uh, using uh, social class wearing jeans, or, sorry, uh, wearing jeans, and listening decadent music from the West. Okay, if you would like to know more about everyday life in this period, of course, uh, the main source uh, are those two books, uh, which I uh, had a chance to be um, to, to cooperate with. And here are three more from the series. The series is marked by this stamp. Uh, it means uh, the happy, happy future or happy tomorrows. Uh, the first book um, is about rock and roll music or big beat uh, from uh, 1958 to uh, up to the Velvet Revolution in 1989. The second one is um, about those process with Manichki, means Brakten and Blasi, so give us back our hair, uh, the detailed uh, reports of uh, uh, this movement and uh, 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 oppressions from uh, state policy. And the third one is um, called Sostrunitsky Dushis, it means grinders of uh, human, human um, souls, um, about uh, people who are responsible for uh, liberty prohibity and uh, cleaning uh, our public libraries from uh, Western decadence.
essentially supporting the opposing force in the field to bring about a political end. We are now looking at a situation in Syria. What happened over the weekend? A resolution over Syria was vetoed. By who? China. China and Russia. For me, the scariest conceivable arrangement for the last 20 years has been that the Russians turn east. And they effectively accept a partnership with China. And it's two against 13. Two against 13. Negligible. But the two are rather large folks. Uh, I don't know if you ever remember uh, the King of Montenegro when he was confronting the Sultan saying, We and the Russians? Yeah. <laughs> well, in this case, I think Moscow is saying, We and Beijing. Well, the Beijing, in fact, means this is any serious commitment. We do not know. We know their diplomacy has been active. We know they've been to Saudi Arabia. We know they have a special arrangement with Iran. But where this goes and how this will play out, we're unclear. And when we talk, and we have now, what is the conversation which is now going on about the nuclear problem in Iran? What is being talked about? Well, sanctions. Okay. We're applying more and more sanctions. And one state is particularly saying, and if the sanctions don't work, there's a window here where we have to do something. Between April and June. And we don't know what the consequence of that action will be. We don't know how other powers are going to respond to it. This is something that is in play now, and we've got a military equation here where the control rods, the kind of things that would manage bilateral conversations. What about U.S.-Russian relations right now? Where are they? Frosty at best. We, we seem to be positioning ourselves for Mr. Putin to disappear, but I wouldn't bet on that. I would suspect in March he's going to probably win the first round. If he doesn't, he'll surely win the second. And then what? Where are we? The interactions of the technologies at this point, I think is what I want to come back to you. Global Zero made sense if it was initiative that drew other powers into a process of de-escalation. There are signs, Russians, in terms of use of nuclear weapons, that we're worse off now than we were earlier. And it's not just the Russians. The Indians are talking about modernizing their military, so they will be able to go from what they call a cold start if there's a war with Pakistan. Pakistan has a conscription army. It is maldeployed because of Afghanistan. So what are the Pakistanis saying? If we are attacked by India, we will do what? First use of nuclear weapons. There are every reason in the world to get back on the agenda that this is, in fact, a key international problem. And it is one, proliferation is not going to be managed by threatening states with what is, in fact, non-nuclear non means To terminate their programs. We finally came around to recognize when the Chinese said, thank you, don't talk about that, with North Korea. And North Koreans already have nuclear weapons. In Iran, there seems to be no one who, in fact, acts as a check on possible actions. And so you've got yourself in a situation where the momentum for arms control as an international process has collapsed and where, uh, quite frankly, their crisis situations, there don't seem to be any international instruments to deal with them. The setback of the United Nations, particularly the inability of the five members to cooperate, puts us in an entirely different box.
global zero was a matter of decades. I want to make that point. But it was one that the commitment had to be maintained. Uh, President Obama got his Nobel Peace Prize because of his commitment to global zero. And now global zero seems to be an orphan. Okay, questions or comments?